Ladies and gentlemen, President, good morning. I, I, um, I feel really privileged and I'm grateful to you for an opportunity to present at this um, uh, media meeting of VET partners. I was watching the television this morning and, and bearing in mind that I'm the, uh, I think the only Brit here, uh, I was looking at the television watching the press conference where at Chequers where your president and my prime minister were talking together about the future of our, of our countries. And it occurred to me then that whatever our individual political views might be or however you might regard your president or however I might regard my prime minister, what is fundamentally important is that the strength of our friendship between our two countries and our working together for our two countries over many generations should continue. And that applies not only to sort of world politics, but it also applies in this great profession of ours. I mean, I'm proud to be a member of my veterinary profession. It's a small profession in terms of numbers, but it's a great profession in terms of the relationships which build between veterinarians and those who work in veterinary practices around the world. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for uh, allowing me to, uh, to contribute. I want to talk about the pressing challenge which I think is facing uh, our profession here in the United States and in the UK. There are far too many practices in both our countries which are, I believe, generating inadequate levels of profit. <coughs> In the UK, a study that I've been involved in, we have a Society of Practicing Veterinary Surgeons, SPIVs, we call ourselves SPIVs, uh, and a study that we're uh, currently looking at has come to the conclusion that the median profitability of veterinary practices in the UK is just under 10%. I think the figure in the United States is currently in the order of 12%, so there's not a great deal of difference between the two. In the UK, the Vet Partners, you may remember some years ago, Vet Partners established a report, I think the, the, um, the No Low Profit Report, in which profitability, were, profitability levels were scored as excellent, good, satisfactory, uh, inadequate, poor, something of that sort of range. In the, in the United Kingdom, 30% uh, of practices, roughly, are generating profits currently which are, dis which are scored as good or excellent. That means that 70% of practices are scoring levels of profit which are inadequate. Uh, and 15% of practices are losing money on the basis of paying the practice owner or owners in their clinical role a salary which is equivalent to the average salary paid to, paid to their employee veterinarians, 15% uh, of practices in the UK are apparently losing money. On that basis, the results suggest that something like 2,800 veterinarians in the United Kingdom working in probably 456 veterinary practices, uh, veterinary businesses which are losing money. That's serious. Uh, but I don't think the seriousness is well understood by my profession in the United Kingdom. What about the United States? Um, the UK percentages are very similar to those quoted in that no low report from Vet Partners. Uh, and a survey that I was involved in for a tiny survey, it was just 70 uh, practices in North America and the United States and Canada, which I was involved in for a private client last year, produced uh, results which are also very similar to current results in the UK and the results which I understand uh, are continuing as far as the United States are concerned. So on that basis in the United States, I think you have something like 90,000 veterinarians working in the United States. On the same sort of basis, it suggests that there may be 13,000 veterinarians in North America who are working in practices which are making a loss. That's serious. That's really serious. The question is, I, I, I'm an old man. I mean, I've been involved in veterinary practice for a long, long time. And uh, in the last 40 or 50 years, 40 years or more ago, we, we, as a profession, we came to the conclusion that there was a link between good medicine and good business. 
uh, good business depended on good medicine, and good medicine resulted in, uh, in, in good profitable businesses. So why is it, after all those decades, with the establishment of lots of consultancy services, uh, management, CPD, consultants, advisors, and support service, why, why, hasn't, why, why hasn't the situation changed? I don't, have, I don't know of any evidence at all that the profitability of veterinary practices in the, uh, around the world has improved significantly in the last 40 or 50 years. There's clearly no shortage of advice. Maybe it's just not being implemented. Or maybe practice owners and managers need to learn the lesson that we, those of us who are veterinarians or, or vet technicians or veterinary nurses, those of us who are involved as clinicians, we learned a long, long time ago that effective treatment requires an accurate diagnosis. And I know in the United Kingdom, you could spend all day, every day, if you're minded to, attending conferences, seminars, webinars on practice management type issues. And you would go away with a list of sort of 20 things that you might do, 20 policy changes you might initiate to improve the profitability of your practice. And that's a sort of blunderbuss approach to treatment. What's, what we learned as clinicians was that the more, more accurate with the diagnosis, the more likely it was going to be that the treatment that you implemented was going to, going to be effective. I, I'm, I'm a sort of a numbers man, really. If, when I was actively involved as a, as a, as a uh, management consultant, people would phone me up and they'd complain that the clients were all going down the road. They needed maybe a new... Could, could, John, could you help me to find a new head receptionist because... The, the existing reception is upsetting all the clients and they're all going down the road. And I'd, I'd come in and I would always say, the first thing I need to know is let's look at the numbers. Get a feel about the numbers. Then you'd investigate and investigate and you'd discover that in fact this was happening but it had nothing to do or little to do with the question of the head receptionist. It's a question of getting to the bottom of it. Uh, and, I, and I think one of the problems that we have is that if you're a practice owner or manager, you're bombarded with practice management software, you're bombarded with data. There's tons and tons and tons of data. Uh, maybe too much data, but not enough real practical information for decision makers. And so if I would, was talking to a practice owner, I might start to ask some numbers. I'd say, well, how many active clients do you have in your practice on a per veterinarian full-time equivalent basis? And they'd say, well, I, I don't know, but I could find that number out from my software. And I'd say, do you know how many you're losing every year? Do you know how many, on a per vet basis, how many new cust clients you have to register every week of every year in order to stay where you are now? Do you know, for example, what the occupancy rate is in your consulting rooms? Do you know, for example, what uh, compliance is for, for how many, on how many occasions does a veterinarian request dental treatment be carried out, and in principle the client agrees, but then it doesn't happen for a variety of reasons? And they would say, no, I don't know those numbers, but I could ask my practice manager, and she could ask the practice management software, and I say, well, do that. And the trouble is that they don't, it just seems to me that if you own or manage a practice, there are some numbers, there are some numbers that you need to have at your fingertips, but just a few numbers. So the question is where to start. Now, so what I'm suggesting really is that, that we use a benchmark-based profit builder approach, which is based on a number of principles. The first principle is that we need to select just a very few numbers to start with. I've been involved with SPIVs. Uh, uh, it's a profitability survey. And we set, up, set out at the beginning, we said, in order to be, for this to be successful, it has to be very easy for practice owners and managers to submit their data on, on, online. We, want, we don't want a great list of data, just a few numbers. Um, it has to be, we want it to, to be a free service. 
we wanted it to enable to, for the practice owner or manager to receive a very short report uh, online or by email within a day or two. Um, and so we came up with this concept that for practices who submit their data to, uh, to, to, an, to an online benchmark service, they receive just five numbers, five key numbers. And the key numbers are three cost headings because whatever accountants tell you, the financing of... Uh, <laughs> I know there are a lot of accountants in the audience, so I'm getting sort of uncomfortable now. <laughs> but, but like all of us, we, we pretend that veterinary medicine is a very complicated business. Lawyers tell you that's complex too. It's all really simple stuff, most of it. Uh, there are only three numbers in veterinary practice, three cost headings. It's the cost of the stuff you're selling or using in, uh, in uh, providing the services that you provide. It's the cost of all the people and it's the cost of all the rest. I mean, there are only three numbers. So what you need to know is what are those three numbers as a percentage of revenue, as a percentage of the gross income of the practice? Then there's another number that we call TVI, which is a transaction volume index. It is just an index. It's a, it's a measure of busyness. Um, if a practice asks me, uh, if, if, a, if I receive some, the data for a practice and they ask me for advice, the first thing I look at is TVI. If their profit is, is disappointing or poor, but the TVI is high, then I know instantly that although there may be all sorts of problems, shortage of customers is not, is not the key problem. There are other problems there. So it's just a measure. I mean, to give you an example, the TVI ranges for between seven or eight to 18 or 20. It is just an index. Um, you can't say that it has anything to do with an average number of transactions that a veterinarian is dealing with on a daily basis. It is just an index. So those are the four numbers. And then the fifth one is the net profit. That's the real level of profit after allocating a... Uh, we only tweak the accounts on the basis of allocating a salary for the clinical role for the owner or owners based on the average of the salary they pay their employee vets. Okay. The report also produces generic quartile data based on percentages. So it's applicable to all currencies uh, and any vet partner practice, uh, uh, client practice. Uh, it's applicable all around the world. <coughs> and the way, so if a practice has its report and it has five numbers, and its profit level is disappointing, what it has to do then is to take each of those numbers in turn and say, is this number higher or lower than the median or the lower quartile or the upper quartile of all the other practices? Because, uh, and I need to know what the significance of that is. So I need to take a systematic approach to diagnosing what might be going wrong if the number, if, my, if the comparison between my practice and all the other practices uh, is significantly higher or lower for that particular measure. <coughs> so a, a program, the program, would, I think, require selective input from and engages with the whole of the practice team. Because we are, however, however big our practices are, we're, we're small teams of people. Everybody involved in the practice uh, has a, an important part to play in, uh, in defining what our objectives are, uh, how, to what extent we're satisfied, we're achieving those objectives now, uh, and what we need to do together as a team of people to get things right in the future. Um, so it, it then takes a systematic approach to review significant adverse variances during a number of in-house management team sessions over an average sort of six month period. That's the sort of time scale that it takes, I believe, in using this sort of a program to get to the bottom of, uh, of what needs to be done. It needs to be intuitive, it needs to be easy to follow, it needs to use a number of diagnostic and other business tools to identify. And the problems, we, we need to work out whether the problem for this particular measure, for this particular issue, 
Is it a leadership problem or a strategic plan business planning issue? Is it a marketing, competition, client awareness sort of an issue? Or is it much more commonly a management, a service delivery, a training, a systems uh, issue? I, I, I constantly reread the book about uh, um, the e -Myth Revisited that I'm sure you've all read about Ray Kroc and how he developed um, McDonald's. And uh, he knew in that sort of system that if, if, a, if a particular restaurant wasn't performing as well as he'd hoped, it was the system, it wasn't the people. In, we, we know in veterinary practice, we've always believed that veterinary practice is a people business. And of course it is a people business. But the problem with people is that the way people behave today may be different tomorrow. It depends on how they're feeling and their mood and so on. So you've got to have the right people. Mark Opperman always says you've got to have niners or tenors, and I'm sure he's right. But you also have to have the systems. It's the systems which are, uh, which are crucial. Uh, and so this sort of a uh, approach could be used in a number of business support models by individual practice teams. So you might have a practice team where the practice manager takes the lead and reviews each stage of the diagnostic process. Or you could have a system where where uh, there was a, a, a consultant uh, advising the practice from afar, or you could have a peripatetic manager sort of approach where a, a practice manager from afar was advising a practice. This sort of approach to diagnosing the underlying problems could be used in a variety of, of ways. Th there are just a few takeaways that I think are important to think about. Firstly, I'm a firm believer that whatever is going right or wrong in a practice, sooner or later it'll show up in the numbers somewhere. Um, what's important is to concentrate on those five uh, and compare with a benchmark with the uh, generic results. Ask is, for this particular number, is this difference significant? And if it is significant, uh, what are the possible sort of causes? There may be three or four possible causes, and then you have to do some homework. You have to use the appropriate tool or do the investigation or search the PMS system to find out what, what's the underlying problem here. Is it a people problem? Is it a training problem? Is it a systems problem? Or what is it? Uh, you need to involve the whole practice team. Uh, and then, finally, you need to address the top two or three issues. Don't try and do 15 things because you'll never do any of them. Choose the top two or three. Concentrate on the top two or three and you make some progress. And I always say be bold with the big picture. If your current level of profit is 10% now, next year it'll be 20%. Okay, so be bold with the, with the big picture. But what makes the difference is the little stuff. It's the little things uh, which, will make the, uh, which will make it happen. Uh, I was involved in setting up the first of the corporates in the United Kingdom, and, uh, and we failed. Uh, we, we ran out of cash, then, which was, I mean, this was emphasized the importance of cash flow. The fundamental, one of the fundamental reasons was we had a chief executive um, who was great with the big picture, but he forgot the little things, the, day-to-day -day little things. You have to answer this letter today. You have to deal with this problem today. It's the little stuff that makes all the, all the difference.